All right. Um, let's just start then with um, James Baldwin's take on the birth of a nation. So this is from his uh, book, uh, A Film Criticism, The Devil Finds Work. Personally, I, I find uh, books like this very useful to read because, I mean, it's a great book. Uh, but it's not like it, it's not the kind of film criticism that I normally write. Um, you know, if if you look at, for example, my my book on uh, uh, Woody Allen, Woody Allen, Real to Real, that in many cases is almost like a scene by scene breakdown of the film. It's like you know, very kind of like technical. I I, I sort of evaluate things artistically. Um, and more recently, though, I have been trying to include more and more cultural critique in the stuff that I'm doing. Um, and James Baldwin was like, you know, the best at that, you know, he wasn't necessarily the best critic when it comes to evaluating art, right, adjudicating uh, what is good, what is bad. Um, but uh, he, he was a he was a, a great cultural critic. And this is sort of what he does uh, when he analyzes film and w- what he's doing in his analysis of the birth of a nation. And to his credit, right, he, you know, although obviously, right, you would expect him to have um, a, a position here, right, on, on you know, uh, black representations in the media, on, on, on black rights, so on and so forth. Um, he never says that this is like a, a shit film, right? Um, he, he, this was written in 1975. And from the beginning, he uh, sort of concedes that this is a great film, but, right? And it's, you could do a lot with that, but though, like, you, you could concede, you could, you could concede quality in art, right? But once you have that but there, and that opens up the door for other forms of critique that are not just purely artistic, that could be very useful, right? So uh, let's not turn away uh, from that too hastily, even if uh, this channel, the stuff that I write, uh, usually takes a bit of a different approach. So this is from his uh, uh, section of the book on Birth of a Nation. The Birth of a Nation is based on a novel I will almost certainly never read, The Klansman, by a certain Thomas Dixon, who achieved it sometime after the Civil War. He did not, oddly enough, write the 1952 film Storm Warning, also about the Klan, starring Ginger Rogers, Steve Cochran, Ronald Reagan, and Doris Day. And like and quite unjustly, Storm Warning, possibly because the Ginger Rogers film speaks courageously for the Union and against the Confederacy, The Birth of a Nation is known as one of the great classics of the American cinema, and indeed it is, right? So keep in mind that, you know, he he, he is not, uh, uh, he's not so insecure in the argument that he's going to make here that he feels the need to, you know, trash the film on artistic grounds. Um, And that's the thing, like, you, you wonder how confident are the people making these sorts of arguments, if in fact they're not willing to concede the obvious as they're arguing for, you know, other things. It is impossible to do justice to the story, such story as attempts to make an appearance being immediately submerged by the tidal wave of the, of the plot. And in Griffith's handling of this fable, anyway, the keys to be found in the images. The film cannot be called dishonest. It has the the Niagara force of an obsession. A story is impelled by the necessity to to reveal. The aim of the story is revelation, which means that a story can have nothing, at least not deliberately, to hide. Um, When I was reading this, I was thinking about this sentence, so let's just reread it again, uh, because I'm not so sure that it's true. A story is impelled by the necessity to reveal. The aim of the story is revelation, which means that a story can have nothing, at least not deliberately, to hide. Um, so j- just to like be clear here, uh, th- the way that he uses the word story uh, versus plot is kind of, uh, I guess it's, it's a little bit similar to what I say when I say things like narrative versus plot, right? I, I don't say story because t- story to me sounds way too much like... Um, uh, it, it just sounds w- way too much like plot, whereas something like narrative opens up a, a, a lot more that you could sort of stuff into it, right? So to me, when I say plot, this is just kind of like, you know, the the breakdown, the scene by scene, what actually happens like in a kind of like almost, you know, physical basis. Uh, a narrative, though, is uh, 
it, it, it's it's kind of like the point that it's getting to and the ways that that we get there, right? Um, so the narrative would be the kinds of choices in terms of you know what is put in, what is put, uh, what is not put in, and why, right? Uh, that why uh, could be important to the plot. Maybe it's not important to the plot, but uh, the, the the plot is basically a, a vehicle uh, for for us to go through the narrative. So. Based on my reading here of Baldwin, I think he's sort of getting at that idea, right? So story, think of it as the way that I just described narrative. Plot is the details of the happenings themselves. But even so, okay, so he says a story is impelled. So a narrative is impelled by the necessity to reveal. So that part, I think in a tentative uh, way, I, I, I could sort of accept that, right? The reason why you would have a novel right, uh, with a certain kind of narrative. The reason why you would have a poem or, or a film with a certain kind of narrative is it's because it, it, it should be told, right? There is a kind of like, weirdly enough, although we don't want to moralize when it comes to the arts, there is a kind of ought statement there um, that, that, that uh, uh, you know, ha- I think does have some heft, it does have some force. And the ought comes from you know, it could come from a few places, but personally, to me, when I, you know, when I think about like a, a new essay or a new book or whatever, you know, whatever, whatever seems to me like it has the architecture for a story, and it's gonna work well as art. You know, I just, I just go in that direction. Um, so, you know, in that sense, like uh, I, I guess you could say there is a necessity to reveal. The aim of the story is revelation. I sort of agree with that. Ultimately, you want some sort of revelation or communication. There's different words you could use. But this next part, which means that a story can have nothing, at least not deliberately, to hide. Well, actually, you you, you could um, uh, have s- some aspects in the narrative to hide, right? Uh, maybe you're, you're just, you know, making certain narrative choices because uh, what you decide to reveal in the plot, let's say you're I don't know, doing an, a book about yourself or a character based on yourself, or maybe you're just not comfortable with uh, certain kinds of revelation. Um, you could actually sort of uh, uh, hijack a bit of the narrative simply by the necessity of the plot, all right? So, and and you know, it doesn't have to be in the negative sense. It doesn't have to be a hijacking. But I think there, there there's more tension here than Baldwin is giving uh, credit to. This also means that a story resolves nothing. The resolution of a story must occur in us with what we make of the questions with which the story leaves us. A plot, on the other hand, must come to a resolution, prove a point. A plot must answer all the questions which it pretends to pose. Um, And uh, this part, too, I'm also not so sure that I agree with. Uh, uh, I I mean, there's plenty of things that a narrative... Um, in the kind of wider sense of like narrative story, whatever that we're talking about, um, there there are certain things that it tries to do and is able to do, and questions that it in fact answers, and questions that are oftentimes are in fact like yeah left unanswered. But uh, let's not forget that th- uh, w- with like great art, there are oftentimes plenty of answers. Um, of course, with great art, there's also like this uh, th- this portion that is like left unrevealed, right? Uh, uh, stuff that is, uh, you know, up to interpretation, stuff that is not so cut and dry, even in a great book with a very kind of clear, you know, like if you know, like in a book exactly where the author stands, um, uh, e- even in those situations, like you're going to have individual elements that are sort of left to the imagination. You just have to, right? You can't, you can't just spell everything out, but simply because you can't spell everything out in art, uh, we, we we shouldn't take that as as, as, as somehow like proof, you know, of the idea that um, in general, like art, you know, merely uh, poses questions, right? Which it's, it's just not true. In the in the heat of the night, for example, uh, turns on a plot, a plot designed to camouflage exceedingly b- bitter questions. It can be said for the defiant ones that it attempts to tell a story. The book of Job is a story, the proof being that the details of Job's affliction never for an instant obscured Job from our view. This story has no resolution. We end where we began. Everything Job has lost has been returned to him. And yet we are not quite where we began. We do not know what the voice out of the whirlwind will thunder next time. And we know that there will certainly be a next time. 
Job is not the same, nor are we. Job's story has changed Job forever and illuminated us. By contrast, the elaborate anecdote of Joseph and his brothers turns on a plot, the key to which is that coat of many colors. That coat is meant to blind us to the fact that the anecdote of Joseph and his brothers, so far from being a record of brotherly love and forgiveness, is an absolutely deadly study of frustrated, fratricide, and frustrated, although elaborately disguised, revenge. When Joseph feeds his brothers, it is not an act of love. He could just as easily have let them starve, which they very logically expected him to do. They just as logically expected him to die when they threw him into the pit. Having done the unexpected once, Joseph can do it twice. Here is the brother who was thrown into a pit by you, my brothers, and left alone there to die. Help yourself, there's plenty. Neither Joseph, nor more importantly perhaps his brothers, have got past that day. It is an act which cannot be forgotten, any more than the branding iron and the skin can be forgotten. And if it cannot be forgotten, which is to say undone, then it will certainly in one way or another be repeated. Therefore, it cannot be forgiven, a grave matter, if one accepts my central premise, which is that all men are brothers." And uh, uh, I mean, you see, like in terms of like uh, you know, all great artists ha have a kind of specific kind of imprint. Well, usually, right? Um, you, uh, th there's like some directors I can think of that are kind of uh, 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 they don't really neatly fit in that. But generally speaking, you know, great artists have a very specific kind of imprint. And for James Baldwin, you know, he 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 you know, grew up uh, spiritual and religious. Uh, he was like a, a child preacher. Um, and, uh, uh, later on though, he never really, you know, he lost a religion, but he didn't quite lose a spirituality, right? So here, you know, he's trying to have this, you know, uh, artistic discussion, right? But the examples that he uses are, they're very well chosen. I, I think the example of Job and the way that he frames this, right? Um, you know, everything Job has lost has been returned to him and yet we are not quite where we began. This is true, right? There is a kind of resolution that, that happens in, in the substance and the meat of the story, um, that 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 uh, is not is not simply undone by by the the, the return of uh, his you know actual physical goods and ultimately when they get multiplied. So this is a very kind of like James Baldwin esque uh, touch, right? Even in, in the choice of examples. Similarly, the birth of a nation is really an elaborate justification of mass murder, and in some ways, I, I agree. I think it is. The film cannot possibly admit this, which is why we are immediately placed at the mercy of a plot labyrinthine and preposterous as follows. The gallant South on the edge of the great betrayal by the Northern Brethren. This is the pastoral and yet doom-laden weight of the early images. Two brothers, robust, two sisters, fair, a handsome house, a loving and united family, and happy, loyal slaves. Unhappily, however, for the South and for us all, a certain eminent Southern politician has a mulatto slave mistress, a house nigger, whose cot he shares when the sun goes down. She does not share his bed, to which he returns shortly before the sun comes up. And the baleful effect of this carnal creature on the eminent Southern politician helps bring about the ruin of the South. I cannot tell you exactly how she brings about so devastating a fate, and I defy anyone to tell me, but she does. Um, I, I would ask the same question, right? This is not very clear in, in the story, and it doesn't help that, I mean, it's just so, like, her, her character is just so ahistorical. We can't even, we can't even look at the historical um, uh, personage and, and say, you know, this is clearly why he made this choice. So um, to me, that's a little bit lost, right? Just like it was on James Baldwin. Without attempting to track my way through any more of what we will call the pre-plot, the war comes. The South is shamefully defeated, or not so much defeated, it would appear as betrayed, by the influence of the mulattoes. For the previously noted eminent and now renegade Southern politician has also, as it turns out, a mulatto protege. We do not know how this happened, but we are allowed to suspect the worst. And this mulatto protege is maneuvered into the previously all-white Congress of the United States, at which point the carpetbaggers arrive and the movie begins. And that's an interesting kind of way to, to view it, right? That everything before was not, 
you know, the actual movie, the actual movie starts there. I think from a purely artistic sense, like that, this obviously is not true. You need those beginning parts simply because, you know, as a, you know, propaganda slash artwork, uh, uh, we, we we need to see those Southern characters in a way where we relate to them and we root for them. And ultimately, like, you know, we, we think they are uh, the victims and all this, because in some ways they are, you know, victimized in the film, right? But that's separate from actual historical observations on the reality of slavery, right? Apart from whatever uh, 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 Griffith was trying to do. For the film is concerned with the reconstruction and how the birth of the Ku Klux Klan overcame that dismal and mistaken chapter in our American history. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, I would say that a, a large point uh, is the reconstruction. Uh, and But I'm not so sure that it uh, overcomes that dismal and mistaken chapter in our ma- American history. Like, there, there, there's, there's, there's no, like, it, it's true that we have kind of like, you know, the logic of the separate universe that I alluded to earlier. Um, you know, it, it's, it's, it's a universe that Griffith obviously, you know, constructs like out of his head, out of ideology, out of, you know, the, the, the myths related to the South, out of, um, you know, lost cause ideology. But, um, you know, uh, weirdly enough, like, yes, we have this kind of odd, happy ending, but like, e- like even by the logic of the film, right, which is the, the, the South lost that war, um, clearly, you know, uh, uh, black people were being given the right to vote. The best thing you could say is that temporarily, you know, uh, these white people that are being vic- victimized by these new black voters, um, you know, they get this like temporary reprieve from that, even in the logic of that universe. Because e- even in that universe, we know that a far more powerful North has brought the South to heel. We're not ever going to be able to have, you know, uh, enough people in the KKK or any kind of similar militia that could overcome that kind of federal power. Like even, 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 you know, and like, you know, I understand that, like, yes, like in a different universe, perhaps it might be otherwise. But, you know, er- even in this universe, everything is still recognizably human, right? Um, a- a- everything is still exactly how you would sort of expect it to be by the logic of human behavior. Uh, you just kind of you just sort of, you know, uh, transfer out some of the historical details and replace them with lies. But that doesn't change, you know, innately uh, the the very human behavior, the human motivations, right? Which is exactly why, you know, uh, again, uh, it, it's so relatable, even as propaganda. Um, so uh, I'm not so sure that I uh, agree with, with this part uh, 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 of it, right? Um, nothing is actually overcome. And, you know, um, it's it's one of those things where, even if you buy the myth, uh, like this happy ending is kind of an illusion, right? J- just like the, 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 the so-called happy ending in Manhattan, like Woody Allen's Manhattan. Uh, we know exactly what's going to happen with a 45-year-old trying to date an 18-year-old girl that is going to go away for a few months to study abroad, right? She's probably going to forget him, you know, through the course of either studying abroad or, you know, the first few years of college, right? That's just probably the reality. So that's a false happy ending. And, and the fact that people fell for it, right, it's just kind of silly. And and here, though, uh, we don't even have to make these kinds of leaps. We know that the happy ending is false because, like, historically, first of all, we know that didn't happen. Even if you buy, like, this conception of, of the South, um, ultimately, the South did lose and the KKK were brought to heel. And even if we had a resurrection of the KKK, um, you know, it, 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 like like everybody watching that knows that this is a a, a past that really w- wasn't ever you know r- really there, right? Um, and that goes beyond like the historical details, right? This isn't just a detail thing. Macro is just not there. The first image of the film is of the African slaves' arrival. The image and the title both convey the European terror before the idea of the black and white, red and white, saved and pagan confrontation. I think it was Freud who suggested that the presence of the black man in America foreshadowed America's doom, which America, if it could not civilize these savages, would deserve. It is certainly the testimony of such disparate witnesses as William Faulkner and Isadora Duncan. For Marx and Engels, the presence of the black man in America was simply a useful crowbar for the liberation of whites. 
an idea which has had its issue in the history of American labor unions. The founding fathers shared this view eminently. Thomas Jefferson and the great emancipator freed those slaves he could not reach in order to create, hopefully, a fifth column behind the Confederate lines. This ambivalence contains the key to American literature. In a way, it can be said to be American literature, all the way from the Scarlet Letter to the Big Sleep. In any case, what Europe really felt about the black presence in America is revealed by the stratagems of the European Americans have used and used to avoid it. That is, by American history or the actual present condition of any American city. Um, And I mean, this is... This, this is absolutely true. Just just think back to how the film begins, right? I mean, uh, I, you know, I said this earlier, like it is kind of weird that that bringing the African is what causes the disunion, right? Um, uh, uh, and, and you could sort of rue this, but the fact is, uh, w- w- you know, that level of, of empathy and like, you know, moral development at that point in human history, you're going to expect slavery. You're just going to have to. Um, yes, you're not going to enslave white people in the same numbers that white people used to be enslaved in, for example, Rome. But um, just just generally speaking, like, um, uh, you know, you, you expect that to happen. Right. And and, and uh, just just by happening, you expect white people because they are participating in this thing that even, you know, uh, uh, those that feel they're justifying it, you know, a- after enough time, just all the justifications falter. The first image, then, of the birth of a nation is immensely and unconsciously revealing, right? I, I kept saying that the, the, the film has so many tells. Were it not for their swarthy color, or not even that, so many immigrants having been transformed into white men only upon arrival, and as it were, by decree, were it not for the title preceding the image, they would look exactly like European passengers, huddled, silent, patient, and hopeful, in the shadow of the Statue of Liberty, Give us your poor. Many of the poor, not only in America, but all over the world, are beginning to find that these famous lines have a somewhat sinister ring. These slaves look as though they want to, su- to enter the promised land and are regarding their eminent masters in the hope of being bought. This is not exactly the way the blacks looked, of course, as they entered America, nor were they yet covered by European clothes. Blacks got here nearly as naked as the day they were born and were sold that way, every inch of their anatomy exposed and examined, teeth to testicles, breast to bottom. That's how darkies were born. More to the point here, it is certainly how mulattoes were born. Um, Yeah, and this is uh, when he said this, I realized I didn't quite notice how uh, at the beginning when you have like the, um, uh, the African slaves uh, being brought to the United States, uh, they definitely do look, you know, kind of like in their dress or whatever, you know, kind of like Americanized or Europeanized, um, which is kind of, you know, unexpected. And, you know, for, for the sake of presenting, um, you know, the South as as the South of, of Griffith, right? This, this had to be done, right? You can't show them naked. You, you can't show them being dehumanized, right? The, the, the black people that are dehumanized in this film are the black people that are not on Griffith's side, which of course was, was like pretty much every black person in existence. Um, but, but in the myth of the film, right. Um, it was, it was, uh, uh, it was kind of like supposed to be more so, uh, uh, more so that, that black and white were in fact in an alliance if it weren't, uh, for those, uh, pesky carpetbaggers from the North. For the most striking thing about the merciless plot on which the birth of a nation depends is that although the legend of the nigger controls it the way the day may be controlled by threat of rain, there are really no niggers in it. The plot is entirely controlled by the image of the mulatto, and there are two of them, one male and one female. All the energy of the film is siphoned off into these two dreadful and improbable creatures. It might have made sense, that is, it might have made a story, if these two mulattoes had been related to each other or to the renegade politician whose wards they are. They are. But no, he seems to have dreamed them up. They are, cre- they are like creatures in a nightmare someone is having, and they are related to each other only by their envy of white people. The renegade politician, I should already have told you, but this is one of the difficulties of trying to follow a plot, is also the heroine's father. This fact brings about his belated enlightenment, the final victory of the clan, the film's denouement, and a double wedding. 
So um, I, 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 f- I found this this take interesting. So let's just reread this part. Um, it might have made sense. That is, might have made a story if these two mulattoes had been related to each other, right? So we're talking about um, uh, Austin Stoneman's uh, uh, servant, right, or common law wife. It keeps being implied, right, that they have a sexual relationship there, um, as well as like the you know the, the guy that he sort of uh, um, you know uh, gives this political power to. Um, but, but you know, uh, he says, but no, he seems to have dreamed them up. They are like creatures in a nightmare someone is having, and they are related to each other only by their envy of white people, right? So uh, I, I found that very uh, uh, telling, right? They are like creatures in a nightmare someone is having, right? So going back to this idea of this kind of closed off universe, right? All, all art in a sense is that, right? Especially great works of art. Um, even like more kind of limited great works of art uh, as as this is, um, you know, th- th- this is like someone scheming, right? This is someone's dream. This is someone's nightmare. This is someone's something, right? It's it doesn't belong just to history. It doesn't just belong to the world of of, uh, of facts and and you know everything that can be historically established, right? Um, uh, we, and, and, you know, to, to the extent that this is a silent film with these like various like tents and all those new techniques, um, and, and also like, you know, the, the, this isn't, uh, uh, intentional obviously, but the fact that we have a certain kind of frame rate, uh, uh, you know, gives it this kind of like little aspect of like irreality, uh, the, 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 the fact that especially here, I mean, you know, so, some uh, silent films were different. Some were a lot more kind of driven by, uh, dialogue driven by, um, you know, like let's let, 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 let's follow what people are saying. But here, you have so much room to just kind of fill in the blanks, right? You have to just imagine what people are saying, and you have to, you know, uh, filter it kind of like through your own lens, right? So this definitely is someone's nightmare, and it's also kind of like you know, uh, if we were going to use this lens, it's it's also kind of like your own nightmare, right? It's it's your own dream sequence. It's 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 what are you giving to these mulattoes, right? Uh, as Bowman calls them, um, you know, w- w- what are you going to imbue them with? I am leaving a great deal out, but in any case, the renegade politician is brought brutally to his senses when his mulatto ward, now a rising congressman, so far forgets himself as to offer himself in marriage to the renegade politician's beautiful daughter, Mrs. Uh, Lillian Gish. The clan rides out in fury, making short work of the ruffian and others like him. The niggers are last seen, heads averted and eyes down, returning to their cabins, none of which have been burned, apparently, there being no point in burning empty cabins, and the South rises triumphantly to its feet. It is not clear what happens to the one presumably remaining mulatto, the female. Neither of the two mulattoes had any sexual interest in the other. Given what we see of their charms, this is quite understandable. Both are driven by an idiot's uh, lust for whites, she for the master, he for the maid. They are, at least, thank heaven, heterosexual, due probably to their lack of imagination. Their lust for the whites, however, is of such a nature that it suffers from all the manifestations of historical hatred. And this is not quite so understandable, except in the gaudy light of the film's intention. The film presents us, after all, with the spectacle of a noble people brought to such a pass that even their loyal slaves are subverted. For the sake of the dignity of this temporarily defeated people, and out of a vivid and loving concern for their betrayed and endangered slaves, the violated social order must, at all costs, be reestablished. And it is reestablished by the vision and heroism of the noblest among these noble. The disaster which they must overcome and in future avert has been brought about not through any fault of their own and not because of any defection among their slaves, but by the weak and misguided among them who have given the mulattoes ideas above their station. Yeah, and I mean, we we get this over and over again, right? Um, We get like a class of exploiters. And uh, black people themselves like are never truly put into this situation, right? A- as the exploiters, because you know, as propaganda, you want to recruit as many people to your side as you can, right? So let's show some happy black people, and let's show 
the happy black people being subverted, right, in James uh, Baldwin's uh, uh, term. But how did so ungodly a creature as the mulatto enter this Eden, and where did he come from? The film cannot concern itself with this inconvenient and impertinent question any more than can Governor Wallace or the bulk of his confreres, north or south. We need not pursue it except to observe that almost all mulattoes, and especially at that time, were produced by white men, and rarely indeed by an act of love. The mildest possible word is coercion, which is why white men invented the crime of rape with the specific intention and effect of castrating and hanging the nigger. Neither did black men fasten on the word mulatto to describe the issue of their own loins, but white, white men did as follows. The root of the word mulatto is Spanish, according to the Webster, from mulo, a mule. The word refers to, one, a person, one of whose parents is Negro and the other Caucasian or white, and two, popularly, any person with mixed Negro and Caucasian ancestry. A mule is defined as, one, the offspring of a donkey and the horse, especially the offspring of a jackass and a mare. Mules are usually sterile. And a further definition, in biology, a hybrid, especially a sterile hybrid, italics mine. The idea of producing a child on condition and under the guarantee that the child cannot reproduce must, after all, be relatively rare, no matter how dim a view one may take of the human race. It argues an extraordinary spiritual condition, or an unspeakable spiritual poverty, to produce a child with the intention of using it to gain a lease on limbo, or failing that on purgatory, to produce a child with the extinction of the child as one's hope of heaven. Mulatto, for the outpost of Christianity, that segment of the race which called itself white, which found itself stranded among the heathen on the North Amer- American continent, under the necessity of destroying all evidence of sin, including, if need be, those children who were proof of abandonment to savage heathen passion, and under the absolute necessity of preserving its idea of itself by any means necessary. The use of the word mulatto was by no means inadvertent. It is one of the keys to American history, present and past. Americans are still destroying their own children. And infanticide being but a step away from genocide, not only theirs. If we do not know where the mulatto came from, we certainly know where a multitude went, dispatched by their own fathers. And we know where multitudes are until today, plotting death, plotting life, groaning in the chains in which their fathers have bound them. Um, and I mean, you know, Baldwin is always a good to read because you always get tons of insight, right? Uh, when I first uh, watched the movie, I did not, um, uh, I did not quite understand, like, you know, what is the point of, the, of these mulatto uh, characters, right? It's kind of like, first of all, they are, uh, you know, e- e- like even more so than Austin Stoneman, right? I mean, like Austin Stoneman, like, yeah, he has a negative kind of portrayal. Even though, like, he's sort of given a kind of grudging respect, right? Um, you know, the word "great" may have fallen out of favor, but you saw, like, in one of the, uh, uh, you know, in one of the, um, uh, like, 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 like text cards, like he was called, like, you know, the the the, the great representative. Because, I mean, if if you're powerful, right? If you're able to get people on your side, right? You know, that th- that is a kind of greatness. Like, maybe not necessarily the kind of greatness that we would all aspire to, but it is a kind of greatness and you get this kind of grudging respect but you know why is is his servant presented in such an over-the-top way right what about his his new like political ally why is he presented such such a way and uh it it, it is an interesting insight that you know these two just they they don't really interact much at all right the um uh the 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 two uh, partly black characters they just don't um they never, you know, like uh, t- to the extent that uh, the, the the politician is uh, like sort of, you know, kept from marrying a white woman. You know, perhaps that's an indication that, you know, in this universe, he doesn't get to marry, period. He doesn't get to have kids. Why? Because just in the back of the head, there's always this uh, idea that, you know, this is like a, a sterile man, right? He, he's not able to have children, you know, because he is a mulatto. Um, or, or, you know, she, she's not able to have children because she's a mulatto. Like, like the, the, the children that we see in the film 
are not um you know are are not the children of uh, stoneman and and his uh you know uh, mistress or his common law wife or his servant whatever we want to call her um it's you know it's it's a, it's a white woman right uh, that that's his daughter um so i mean and again like we're we're saying that this film has a, a large number of tells like is this a tell like are we getting to griffith's uh, psychology uh, by the fact that he chose to play up the fact that you know uh, the uh, um, uh, the woman is like partly black, or this man is partly black, like wh- wh- why 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 do we get this kind of and you know it, like both of them have like an over the top sexuality. They're like yeah, Gus has you know Gus is like kind of like a would be rapist uh, has that that sort of you know quote unquote renegade officer right. Um, uh, but you know, uh, uh, other than him, the over-the-top sexuality really does belong to these two other characters, and why, right? And and it's kind of like it has no place to spill, right? It has no place to go. Um, and, and you know, here Baldwin gets this kind of you know more macro view of well, it do, it does have a place to go, like in the kind of wide historical sense, right? It's it's uh, uh, it's it's towards the having of children. Right, that ultimately get cast off, right? But uh, but as you know, uh, partly uh, black, partly uh, white children, um, uh, they themselves get cast off, and who knows what happens uh, to their children or if they're ever able to have them, right? We never do get to hear about their descendants, do we? Right? Um, and again, like what is going on subliminally, right? Uh, what 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 exactly, um, you know, is going on, sort of like you know, behind the scenes, as it were.